Hey guys, welcome. Uh, about to get started here, so jump on in. Okay, we've got, a, we've got some housekeeping stuff to go over. I'm just going to wait a few seconds here and we'll get going, okay? All right, welcome, guys. We're going to talk injuries tonight, okay? Um, let me start with some um, housekeeping tips. we got about 10 folks here. Um, uh, make sure you got Wi-Fi on. Get, I'll probably put some headphones on, earbuds. Uh, close all your applications out um, and probably put your uh, uh, do not disturb, okay? Um, and uh, if you've got a question during the uh, webinar, go ahead and put a question mark followed by your question. That way we can literally pull that up from the feed, display it on the bottom so we can hand handle your questions there, okay? All right, let's get started. Um, so tonight, I wanna welcome you guys. I'm, uh, if you, for those that don't know me, I'm uh, uh, Michael Merlino, um, Houston-based, Houston, Texas-based running coach and fitness trainer. And um, uh, tonight we're gonna talk running injuries, okay? Um, running's hard, it's repetitive. Um, it's obviously a component of any major sport, and as a result, a lot of us get injured. In fact, the majority of us who embark in any type of running program, training for a race, are going to get injured. Okay, so we're going to talk about that tonight and cover um, some things with injuries, um, some myths behind injuries, some reasons why they happen, and maybe get you guys thinking about some different approaches to to injuries in the future, okay? So we're gonna kinda keep it broad tonight because we could go through many different topics on this, okay? Which we will in the future, okay? So let me, um, let, so pretty much this is the overview of what we're gonna go over tonight, okay? The, uh, as we I mentioned, the biggest running myths that are out there, things you guys hear that may not, you know, that may not be true in most cases, okay? Why injuries happen and what risk factors are behind those things. Um, get you thinking different about injuries and at the end, we'll, ha we'll open up for Q&A and answer your questions, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is bring on my good friend, Dr. Hasenbeck from Nashville, Tennessee. Tennessee. And, and welcome, JD. Hey, Coach, how you What's doing? Up, doc? Good to see and you, and good to see you. Yeah. yeah. So, so Dr. Hasenbeck and I go, I don't know, way, way back, 15 years? Yeah, yeah. at least. And Maybe uh, more than that. Yeah, at, at one, one time, time when, when he started, started his practice, practice here in Houston, Houston I, we, we referred a lot of runners, runners to, his to his practice, and then, and then along the way, he moved to Nashville, Tennessee, Tennessee and uh, so on. Uh, uh, so, so he's he's, he's kind of what I call body, body mechanic guys, guys and, and I love um, working work with them. I wish he was back in Houston, man, because he could fix a lot of my people. But that's right. So I'm going to throw it over to you, Doc, and let's cue it up and talk injuries tonight. That sounds good. We're going to go over some of the biggest myths and mistakes made with uh, running injuries and uh, then we'll talk about injury risk factors and open it up from there um, when it comes to injury myths and mistakes the number one myth that uh, that's out there is that running is bad uh, let's unpack this a little bit uh, running has gotten a bad rap over the years for causing injuries and um, where it may be true that there are a lot of injuries associated with running. Uh, running inherently in and of itself is not bad. So when we think about running, uh, usually there's something else associated with an injury cropping up. And if you think about this with me, most people don't have an injury on one side. I mean, they don't have an injury on both sides. It's usually just on one side. So that's where you have to ask the question, is it the running or is there something else that's causing the mechanism of running to actually irritate, inflame, or injure the body on one side when it's not doing it on the other side? So inherently, um, if you run well and you stack your training and periodize it accordingly, meaning you know just kind of incrementally add to your training, uh, running itself is not bad. So. Let's go ahead and look at our second myth. There we go. Rest is best. So this one right here, it used to be said that um, the acronym was RICE, rest, ice, compress, and elevate. Um, and now, unless something is broken, torn, mauled, and maimed, uh, rest is not best. Uh, we know this from the research that keeping things moving 
is actually best. Mobility is best. They say that motion is lotion, and that's where this myth comes in as well, that when we stop moving something, even if it's hurt, um, it's going to take longer to recover. It's going to take longer to get good blood flow in there, et cetera. I've got a good story about this one. So I have a patient who had just turned 60, and for his 60th birthday, he went with a bunch of guys um, out to a lake in the mountains. Uh, they were going to water ski. They were going to hang out. They were going to go for some long hikes on some uh, uh, mountainous trails, et cetera. And he was trying to get up on a single ski, and uh, he had skied all of his life. And the boat was having a tough time pulling him out of water, and he held on to the rope, really strained, got pulled out and overextended, and literally ripped his entire hamstring. He was coming up on a slalom ski, so ripped his entire hamstring from his knee up to uh, the sit bones, and literally black and blue down the back of the leg, into the calf, and instead of resting it, um, he actually went out on a hike the next day. He took it slow, he took small steps, he didn't try to push it, um, he wasn't in agonizing pain, but it just hurt. It was tight, stiff, achy, hurt. Uh, and by the time he got back to Nashville and got in to see me to get it checked out, his mobility was darn near 100%, and it was no longer in severe pain. He still had black and blue down the leg, uh, into the ankle and the calf from the bleeding of it all, but there was a lot less stuff that I had to fix up because he had kept it moving uh, not only right after the injury, but literally the next several days. He did ice it. He did try to stretch it. But mo case in point is he kept it moving. So active rest is best. Now, if something is actually an OMG style pain and it's causing you to wince and go, oh, my goodness, this hurts, that's when you're going to have a heads up and go, okay, maybe ice it a little bit. But the more you keep something moving, the faster you get it moving, the better it is. So rest is not best. All right, myth number three. Heat it up when it hurts. Um, some like it hot, but really, honestly, ice, ice, baby is the way to go. So heat will bring more blood to the area. Ice constricts vessels and helps keep the blood from pulling up into an area. When something is injured, it's going to have more blood flow to that area regardless. And so... When you heat something up, it may feel better temporarily, but it is the number one mistake that people make uh, when they call me up. If you call my office and you're in dying pain, it doesn't matter if it's your neck, your back, your knee, ankle, foot, whatever, um, and you tell me I've been putting heat on it, I will say I love you, but start putting ice on it and I'll see you tomorrow. I'm not going to squeeze you in today because it's going to hurt. And sure enough, when people start icing, and they do 10 minutes on, 20 off, 10 on, 20 off, and keep it moving in between. Remember, active rest is best, not complete rest. They usually come in the next day and they go, wow, it feels so much better. And that's because that ice constricts the blood vessels for a temporary period, pumps the break on the inflammation, and helps to accelerate and speed the healing process. So, hey, Doc, hey doc real, quick. real quick. Yeah. Um, when, would when would you, you when would, would you use, use heat? heat? Just curious, because I've always, always been told, obviously, and I tell my runners, when there's, when there's inflammation, there's heat. And yes. You, you, you calm the, the heat down with ice. What, what situations, just real quick, would, would there be any situation that are injury-related or otherwise where you would use heat? After the first couple of days, and see, people get, here's another myth. Well, it's already been a couple of days, and, you know, I'm a couple of days out, so I guess ice is not going to work. That's incorrect. Um, ice is going to help the swelling, the inflammation, and the pain. Ice is an amazing pain reliever. It actually deadens those nerves. It helps you move things around without them hurting. Um, if you've in, you, your ice period of two days starts the day you start icing. So if you have an injury seven days ago, but you have not started icing it yet, you're not two days out from using ice. So as soon as you start your two days of intensive ice routine, which is 10 minutes on, 20 off, 10 on, 20 off, then after a couple of days of doing that, you can start to heat, move it, ice it, cool it down. So heat's a great situ heat's a great thing to actually do before you go out and move or out and train. So like if it's early morning, something's a little achy, stiff, 
hop in the shower. Take a warm, warm shower before that long training run. That way, when you get out there, make sure you stay warm, you know, put a hoodie on, put some sweats on, get out there. You're already warmed up, you know, so heat is great for warming up and helping to get moving. Heat's just not the best when something's inflamed. Like you get done with, you get done with a run and you go home and something's hurting. And then you're trying to move it around. It feels stiff, feels tight. The last thing you want to do at that point in time is put heat on it. You want to put ice on it. You know. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for clarifying, clarifying that because people, people get, get sometimes, sometimes they get, they get five, five different answers, answers from five, five different <laughs> talks. That's true. And there was a phase. There was a phase about five, six years ago or maybe a decade ago where um, everybody was poo-pooing ice and they were saying yeah. heat, heat is what brings the blood to the area. Heat is what um, – helps the healing process but uh it also just blows stuff up and just makes things so tight and swollen that uh it hurts and it's hard to move so okay just yep. curious about that thanks absolutely for great that. great question all right let's roll on to our risk factors so injury risk factors there are multiple but i'm going to go over the top three particularly where it surrounds running but this is also very true of any overuse style injury. Now, most of the injuries in running are overuse in nature. Very rarely do we get to step off the curb, roll the ankle. Most of the times we're dealing with plantar fasciitis. We're dealing with Achilles tendonitis, IT band syndrome. Um, interestingly enough, uh, hip injuries aren't overly prevalent with traditional long distance running, whether we're talking about half marathon or marathon. Hip injuries are more associated with high intensity running like track work or hill work or, or even cross country. Um, and th then you can also get back issues as well. But here are our risk factors or what makes us uh, more easily at risk for having an injury. The number one risk factor is having had a previous injury. And a lot of people don't consider this. They think, oh, that was then, this is now. It's been 12 months. It's been two years. It's been 12 years since I twisted my ankle. And they don't realize that a previous injury sets up muscle memory compensations where your body still remembers or it's still compensating to that original injury. And those compensations don't just magically go away. You have to actually go in and find and fix them. And you've got to retrain them. It's almost like going in and reprogramming the system to say, hey, we're not going to hurt you again. That was then. This is now. Here's how we're going to do it. So that is the number one risk factor. And that is where a lot of times running gets its bad rap is somebody will be like, well, um, I've rested and I have waited and, you know, I did these stretches and these exercises. and I Googled this and Googled that and I tried, but then. It came back again, running must be bad for me. And then you ask them the question, well, is it on both sides? And they're like, no, it's just my knee on my left side. Okay, um, your body's, you know, something's happening there that's not happening on the other side. Let's go ahead and find and fix what's causing the, causing the injury, right? Kind of solve the source. So number one risk factor is having had a previous injury. Don't discount those injuries that you had a long time ago. Proactively try to find and fix what's not working well on one side versus the other. So let's go to risk number two. Risk number two, one of these things is not like the other, meaning this side doesn't move or work like this side. And when somebody comes in and they've gone and seen a whole bunch of people and they've had x-rays, MRIs, you name it, and everything looks good, everything looks fine. Um, the easiest thing to do is start to check things out and say, which one of these things is not like the other? And typically the side that has the injury is the side that is not gonna be moving like the other side. Now I do have a weird example of this. And I had a um, soccer player at Rice University when I was there at Houston, I used to take care of Rice University athletics. And one of my soccer players said, um, oh, doc, I keep having this hip issue on my left-hand side. And so we were going through finding and fixing the things that were 
working well on that side compared to the other side. Um, but they just kept coming back, and there was no reason. I mean, I looked down at her foot. Her foot was working fine. Her knee was working fine, but ha- keep, kept having this hip issue. Finally, I backed up, and I said, you know, I'm missing something. So let's look at things from a 20,000-foot view. I started checking her neck, checking her shoulders, and finally, boom, there it was. I said, what's going on with that right shoulder? And she goes, oh, I was going to tell you that after you fixed up my left hip. And I went, oh, now we know why you've got a hip issue. Soccer player, every time she would try to, you know, be maneuvering or kick the ball, um, that shoulder issue on that right side was causing her to have to overcompensate in that left hip. I would have had no clue that she had a shoulder issue, um, except for the hip kept coming back again and again. Now, that's a rare example. Typically, if you're going to have a left-sided low back, hip, knee issue, it typically is going to come from somewhere lower down or higher up in that movement chain on that side. So when somebody has a left-sided knee issue, we always go down and check it, check at the ankle and the foot, and then we come up and check at the hip and the back on that side. And that's usually where we find the answer is it's either something that's not functioning correctly lower down or higher up that's causing it. So this risk factor one of these things is not like the other means that one side just is not moving. It's not as stable or it's just not firing muscles in the right order like the other side. Let's go on to risk number three. Too much too soon. This is one of those things where people go, oh, like I'm ready to get back into this. Ah, I can run. I can run two, three miles. No problem. Who cares if it's been eight, nine weeks since I've been out there running, I can do it. And they go out there and they run two, three miles. They feel great. They get done. A couple days later, another two, three miles. A couple days later, another two or three. And a week or two goes by and they start having these little aches and pains. Well, those aches and pains start to turn into stuff that blows up and is irritated, inflamed. Um, And they're like, I don't understand it. I was doing great. Everything was fine. Everything was feeling great. And they didn't realize that their cardiovascular system can adapt to endurance exercise much faster than their ligaments, tendons, bone, cartilage, and even fascia. And so that type of stuff takes longer to adapt and to strengthen when you put stress and pressure across it than does the cardiovascular system. So cardiovascularly, they were feeling great. They were like, I can do this, I feel fine, feels amazing. But when it came down to their bones, their ligaments, their tendon, their cartilage, et cetera, and even their fascia that surrounds the muscles, those things just kept getting little microtrauma that didn't have enough time to recover from the pounding that was being put across it. So then people end up going, well, maybe I'll rest a day or two. And then they go back out there, try it again. And sure enough, there it is again. Well, maybe I'll rest a week or two. And then it comes back again. And then they get frustrated. So um, too much too soon is not only just a volume thing, meaning adding time and miles. Too much too soon could be adding intensity. It could be speed saying, oh, well, I was running at this pace. Now let's go ahead and push the pace. And you jump that intensity or that pace up let's like for instance you're running on your own you're training on your own and then you get with a pace group and you're like oh i can hang i can do this thing and it ends up being too much too soon that blows something up the other thing that people do a lot of times and don't consider is they'll go from training on a treadmill during the winter time because it's nasty outside it's cold outside and then they hit the pavement and they go i was feeling fine i was doing this volume on a treadmill but now like things are hurting and the opposite happens too when you've been pounding the pavement and you decide to go to switch over to a treadmill that's just a change that your body's not used to if you try to do the same volume at the same pace when your body's gotten used to and is adapted to uh, pounding the pavement and you go on the treadmill and you think that should be easier but it's really not it's more springy or somebody goes on spring break and says I'm going to do my two, three mile run on the beach. And what they don't realize is they're now working harder on the beach and they come back and they've got shin splints and things hurt. It's just, it's too much of a change too soon 
versus working yourself into that new um, that new platform or that new um, intensity or pace or duration or surface. So that's where this risk factor comes in. All right, coach. One quick, one quick question quick I had for you. What you got? I mean, I know, I know there's, there's those are the top three, three but um, could you briefly talk, talk about, about biomechanics? And, you know, of course, this gets into running form, which we could go crazy with that. But Oh, sure. Um, like, you know, I know these are the top three, but what have you seen there, like, on the biomechanical side? You know, like uh, muscle imbalances, I mean, between quad and hamstring, things like that. Well, that would be one of these things is not like the other. So okay. when we're talking about biomechanics and we're talking about muscle imbalances or quad ham ratios, I mean, we got really technical with this stuff 20 years ago when I was starting practice. And fast forward 22 years, um, it's just gotten a lot simpler. I mean, it's one of those things where if one side has the range of motion that the other side has, whether or not your ham... You, what, if you can't touch your knees because your hamstrings are so tight, but we lay you on your back and one leg can lift up the same as the other, chances are you won't ever have any back issues, hip issues, knee issues because of the same. Okay. You could be able to put your, you could be a ballerina and put your leg on your ear on one side and on the other side, like be a couple inches off and things will hurt. You know, if one of these things is not like the other, range of motion wise or even strength wise, that's where you can start to get into that imbalance. Now, when it comes to quad ham ratios, that's just the difference between your pelvis being tucked underneath and your spine and legs being in alignment and straight and it being tilted forward because your quads are too tight, your back's now hyper arched and your butt's kicking out and your belly's pooching out because your hamstrings don't have enough strength to be able to lift that pelvis up into that position right there. That's called lower cross syndrome. And that is actually one of those things that um, we work a lot with people on, teach them how to stretch their hip flexors out, teach them how to um, stretch their quads out and strengthen their hamstrings and their glute to be able to get that position so that everything looks straight in alignment when you're talking about going up the front side and the back side of the ham quad pelvis back ab complex right there instead of things being tilted right here and then going straight here they're now in that alignment right there yeah okay yeah um so i so guess, guess what we'll, we'll do guys, guys is open, open up for questions, questions. just so you guys, you guys know, know we we, we kind of talked about, about putting, putting this, this together, together. um mm -hmm. we kind of went, went down, down a rabbit, rabbit hole of <laughs> like, like literally, literally we could, we could we wanted, we wanted to start, to start high, high level, level and we're, we're, we're going to have, have some upcoming some webinars where we get, get a little, little bit deeper, deeper into these different topics, topics you know, but, you know, but tonight, tonight we just wanted to kind of give you guys a general overview of things. Um, but uh, the only, the only other, other thing, thing, anything, anything else, else Doc, you, you could think, think of, of that, that that people are being told, and I'm talking, you know, there's no right or wrong to this, but, you know, they're told by their, you know, my gosh, if I have, if I hear the running, the running's bad thing. And that's, and that's usually, usually coupled, coupled with taking an anti inflammatory You know, I would, I would like, like to, to kind of get your take real quick. My question, and we'll open it up for questions, questions here. here. Like, like on, on the anti-inflammatory anti thing. thing. Okay, like when, when to and when, when not, not to, because, because a lot of studies out there show that's obviously, obviously it'll mask pain, pain if you've got an anti-inflammatory, anti you know, floating float through your system. But because um, I've had runners end up in medical tents at races because of that. So Yeah. Well, that's not even the worst thing of it masking pain. And... Some people will say, well, it gives you gut ulcers, like it ulcerates your gut. That's not even the worst thing about taking anti-inflammatories. Um, the worst thing about taking anti-inflammatories is it does stop the, the inflammatory process. That's the worst thing about taking anti-inflammatories. And when you stop the inflammatory process instead of pumping the brakes, what happens is, is you have a delayed to heal and delayed to recovery process. So somebody who's like, oh, I'm gonna outsmart this. I'm gonna take some anti-inflammatories before I go out and run, before I go out and play golf, whatever it is. The inflammation that should have been there from that activity 
is not, which means you just broke down your body and now it has no signal or no way to know that it needs to build back up or to what extent it needs a rest and recovery. Like don't waste your pain. Pain is pain is purposeful, right? I mean, when people eliminate pain, um, I always tell them, look, pain is inevitable. Suffering's optional. I mean, there are ways to pump the brakes, but if you're trying to get rid of pain, you're also going to get rid of the gains. And you're going to miss the signal of, oh, maybe I shouldn't go back out there. So if you take an anti-inflammatory before you go out and run, you go do your run, you come home and you're like, oh, I don't feel too bad. And then the next day you're like, no, I'm not, I'm not too bad. Maybe I'll go out and do something else instead of run. Maybe we'll go hike. Maybe we'll bike. Maybe we'll go lift. And then you're breaking down the body yet again. Oh, well, I hurt now. Well, let me go ahead and take some more anti-inflammatories. Well, now you've stopped two rebuild processes. And when we get into overtraining, our overtraining lecture, where we should always be overreaching, meaning do more than your body can handle so that it can then rest, recover, rebound, and super compensate to get even more fit, more resilient than what it was before. But if you're cutting off that process of not allowing it to actually rebound, rebuild, and become more resilient, all you're doing is chipping away, breaking down, breaking down, breaking down, breaking down, breaking down. And that's where something starts to, that's where something's going to snap, rip, or tear because now the tendons, ligaments, joints, and bones aren't more resilient. And people end up getting stress fractures. People end up getting, mm -hmm. you know, micro tears and tendons, tendinopathies. And then they're surprised that, oh my gosh, my Achilles ripped or my plantar fascia ripped. Or now I had a stress reaction that it turned into a stress fracture, you know, or cartilage that now is actually worn down to the point it's caused the bone to be dead underneath. You know, instead of the bone growing up and getting more dense, it just died because it got broken down and bruised so much, you know? Yeah, and I, I, don't know. I don't know. I guess, I guess what, what I'm hearing, hearing too is, um, you know, runners, runners just, just can't, can't stop, stop running, running, man. <laughs> you know? so, like, like, so, so kind of what, kind you're, what you're saying, saying is, is maybe, maybe the best, best anti-inflammatory anti is just to do something that's active, active that's not running, running, like walking. Absolutely. Like I mean, elliptical trainer. Like, like hello. Stationary bike. Like, go jump in the pool. Swim? <laughs> yeah. yeah, something like that. But, you know, yeah, we're, we're runners. runners. We're, we're freaks. freaks. What can and I here's, tell you? here's the thing. So good. Participate in running. Just throw a little belt on and go aqua jog. I yeah, mean, yeah. do the same motion as running. Just do it in a pool, right? Yeah. But, um, but sometimes, sometimes you got to pivot and stop running. Well, right? here's, yeah, the, I mean, here's the thing. If all you do is keep driving your car and you don't ever stop to give it a rest, you don't ever stop to let it cool down, you don't ever stop to actually change the oil, change the tires, rotate the tires, and you're miffed that your tires blew out and your engine's overheating and something stuck and freeze or crack the, crack the headers or whatever it is in your car, you'd be like, I don't understand. Well, you'd be like, well then like give your car a break, you know, let it cool down, do some maintenance on it, make sure to balance some things out. And that's the same thing with our body we get out of this mindset of our body's a machine. We just think it's there to tag along on our journey. When really, honestly, we need to treat it like a machine, which is we go stress it and then we rest it and let it recover. We stress it, mm -hmm. rest it, let it recover. Now, if our cars were like that and we could stress them and take them back and let them rest and recover long enough to actually get faster, stronger, better, like that would be a pretty amazing machine. And that's what we get to live with, but we only get one. We can't trade in this model, yeah. right? We can't trade in this model or be like, hey, let's swap that part for this part. You know, let's go ahead and, and upgrade that. I want the XT model or the LX model, you know? Yeah. So knowing that our bodies are adaptive machines, if you keep that mindset and you keep that framework, then you got to realize that every time you stress it, you have to rest and recover it. And what I mean, every time I say rest, I really mean sleep. Like go yeah. sleep. That's one of the best recovery. We'll, we'll have a, an entire webinar on recovery and how to actually okay. recover and get more resilient. And it's all part of the how to prevent overtraining, which is how to also prevent injuries. It's doing too much too soon. That's the, that's the risk factor. Number three, too much too soon. Um, it's all about rest recovery, 
resilience and being proactive during your rest period, which is like you said, go out for a walk, go out for a hike, do something different, go for a bike ride, you know, <laughs> like go, ta that. go take a Zumba class, whatever <laughs> yoga, just you know, just body. do, just move your body, but do something different. Um, and one other thing to remember, the foot does hit the ground about a thousand times a mile and it does absorb three to five times your body weight every time it hits the ground. Now, you do the math on that. You take your body weight right now, multiply it times three, and then multiply that times a thousand. That's how much poundage is actually happening in a single mile. How, well, how many miles are you putting in during the week? Yeah. How about a month? Yeah. A year? A decade? Like your body needs recovery. So be smart, be wise. It's an amazing machine to be able to handle that much force and to be able to actually turn around and wake up the next day and be able to walk again. It's That's pretty yeah. phenomenal. I mean, if we put that much stress across a vehicle, it would microfracture in all of the actual weld points, and then eventually stuff would start cracking and falling apart. I mean, so just be just be kind to your body stress it but then let it rest and recover and be active with that recovery process and you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish but also you got to be wise and making sure you systematically are checking each hip each knee each ankle each foot each toe to make sure it's moving like the other side if it's not you got to figure out solutions for that because that will be, be your Achilles heel um, to having an injury. All right. Sound uh, good? We want to open up for questions, questions Doc. Doc. I've got, got a question, question from Tatiana, Tatiana here, here on your thoughts, thoughts on, on foot orthotics. orthotics. I know that, that would that could possibly be one whole webinar, but yep. just generally speaking, what you, what are your thoughts on, you know, I guess when it's needed, you know, um, which I know a lot of times is probably more rare than what people think, but. Yeah, I was in. I was big into making orthotics, and uh, Michael used to. You probably remember. I used to have people mm -hmm. go across a computerized footbed that had a thousand sensors that scanned it sixty times a second. We could see exactly where that foot landed, exactly where it loaded in the midfoot, and exactly where it pushed off coming through. And I'd make people orthotics, and what I realized was people were taking these high end computer motion built custom orthotics and they were sticking them in shoes that were the counter opposite of what the orthotic was attempting to do and it was canceling it out it's sort of like that push pull effect if you if you turn one speaker on and it's going this way and the other one's going the opposite way well now they now they both cancel out the actual wave or frequency or the sound um so orthotics can be tricky i always say start with the shoe Start with the shoe platform, make sure it's the right shoe for your body. And that actually is a totally separate 45 minute yeah. seminar. I mean, that we could turn into probably a three hour teach you how to fit your own mechanics, but that's where I would start first is start with the shoe, make sure, make sure you have the right shoe for you. And then if you need more support, that's where you can build the orthotic into the equation. Again, like I said, I used to make people $600 pair of orthotics. And when Rice University finally came to me and said, we love your orthotics, but we can't afford them for all of our athletes, give us another solution. And I went and bought all the non-prescription over-the-counter orthotics like, off of like Amazon. Spenco. Spenco, yep. Spenco, super feet. Spinco was the one I found I could modify. So I could take a Spinco um, orthotic and they have these little tabs on the bottom that I could rip out to get somebody's foot to canter in like this when they were used to rolling off the outside of their mm -hmm. foot. So I could take the center ones out and get their foot like this, but still I had to get, I had to get the shoe platform right first. And then I could actually get a $30, $40 orthotic to actually give the little bit more. And um, orthotics for me are not about arch support. Um, they are about cantering devices in and out. So I can get somebody who's used to going off the outside of their foot and their knees track outwards and it snaps the IT band on the outside. That's why they have IT band issues. Mm -hmm. And I can get them to canter more in like this, take that pressure off the IT band, loosen up their hips, their calves, their feet. 
Um, so I use them as, as mechanical devices to get people to push off the inside versus roll off the outside of that foot right there. So, so, there, so, that, so that would, would be, be the hybrid. hybrid. Like I know, I, know, um, I, remember, I remember when, when Dr. Dr. Ross, our, our podiatrist, podiatrist here in town, you know, he, he, he would do orthotics, orthotics like you did, but mm -hmm. a lot of times we do like gate night at the store. Yeah. And he was like, I was, I was, the, I was the prescription guy. He's like, you know, he write, write these notes down. He's like, yeah, that lady needs a Spenko off the shelf. Yeah. That, that lady definitely needs correction. And I yeah. think it was maybe one out of, maybe one or two out of 20 people were, it, were even candidates for a custom orthotic. And that is why Dr. Ross is rare and why you love him. I loved him. Because even people in my field, they're orthotic hungry and happy. We got to cast you an orthotic. We got to mold your foot. We got to do this and do that. And, and quite honestly, unless it's a functional orthotic, meaning something that's not absolutely rigid, something that's just helping to guide the process, um, then, then it really is your, your rarity that you actually need to have that prescription orthotic, number one. Number two, um, when, it comes to per, when it comes to orthotics, they're only there for a season. Once your muscles actually adapt to the new way of doing it, it no longer needs that support. It actually is over support. You, yeah. you actually drive the opposite. So we would have people that had issues on the outside of their legs or knees. Eventually a year later say, well, now the inside of my knees hurt. And I go, perfect. That's it. It's time to take these out. And sure enough, we check their mechanics and we do their video analysis and they were spot on. And it was like, your muscles have adapted, you're good to go. You, so the type of shoe that you need today and the type of orthotic you need today isn't what you're gonna need in six to 12 months. You gotta keep checking and keep adapting accordingly. Well, like that, I'm a good, a good example. example. That was, that was an over pronator, pronator when, when I saw, I saw Ross, Ross the first time. time. Yeah. When I fractured my toe and he, and he put, put me back, back together. together. And, um, and, then and then over the years, like, like I remember he put my x-ray up. up. He's, He's like, like, yeah, I can tell you're a runner. I'm like, how do you know that? He's like, well, here's a, here's a, Here's a senior that's seven years old, and here's your. He's, he's like, you know, you literally grow bone density in your feet. Mm -hmm. And really, down the road, I was always, uh, I always needed stability shoe because I, I had pretty flat feet. But over the years, I'm just, I've, I've actually literally morphed into a neutral, neutral Abs foot. Absolutely. I mean, I used to, I used to over supinate so much, and everybody was like, oh, you need to actually have arch supports on the inside, which drove me further into supination. Yeah further irritated my IT bands and Achilles tendon plantar fasciitis. Um, and then finally, once I figured this out and started modifying myself, I mean, I am now a true neutral. I, mm -hmm. I shouldn't have been, I wasn't, but I Which mean, I was nice able to get to that point. a lot more shoes on that wall to choose from. <laughs> but the other thing is, because of my torso to femur ratio, which they didn't tell us back when they started making five finger Vibram shoes mm -hmm. and zero drop shoes, I will never be a zero drop individual because my femurs are longer than my torso. And that being said, I don't have the ankle dorsiflexion that somebody else who has an even distribution and balance. So you put me in a zero drop or a low drop shoe, I'm constantly going to be irritating my big toe, my plantar fascia, my Achilles tendon. And as soon as you actually lift my heel up and give me a decent drop, Boy, I can go midfoot toe off, midfoot toe off, midfoot toe off, no problem. And that's just because the way I popped out of the womb. Yeah, and I think, I think the, rest the rest of it, of it I, mean, I mean, I'll just kind of throw this in. Guys, guys we, have we have so many, many more shoes, shoes at our disposal. disposal. I mean, you go into oh, yeah. here in Houston. And, 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 then, and then I think, I think it's, it's also, also about, about the fit. fit. And that's why when I send people to – I yes. send to Jerry Fuquay at Fleet Feeder. For sure. Because the guys that really – they were running in the 70s when it wasn't cool, and they know exactly how – it's, it's all about who fits you, too, sometimes. You get in the right shoe, you're good. You know? Yeah, we have a running store here called um, uh, Team Nashville, and uh, they are spot on. I mean, they're just mm -hmm. geeks about fitting people for their shoes. But they also watch their mechanics. They don't just look at their feet and say, oh, you're a pronator. Because yeah. pronators like this can overcompensate in the hips, and their knees actually go out because their hips have compensated to try to pull them up. Well, if you then – pump somebody up like this and their knees go further out, well, all of a sudden you're driving upstream issues and you're missing the big equation on what they really need. So, yeah. All right, all let's right, move, move on. on. I got, I got a Gloria has, has a question. A question. Can, Can an injury, injury change, change your running, running form and cause another injury? Oh, for sure, Gloria. This is where we talk about um, that previous injury, that muscle memory 
and the compensations. So for certain, the perfect example of this is somebody sprained their ankle a long time ago, let's say high school, and now they're in their 30s and 40s or 50s, and they're starting to train for a marathon, but they don't realize that that ankle sprain changed their mechanics and caused them to actually roll off that foot in a different way. All of a sudden, now they're dealing with issues that are not an ankle issue. They'll rarely ever say, my ankle hurts, because it doesn't, because your body's compensated. It's then their knee, or it's their back, or it's their plantar fascia, or something else that's other than their ankle that actually is, um, that's actually causing that injury. So that being said, where you feel your pain, or what I always say, the side of symptoms is rarely the source of symptoms. I'll say that one more time. The site of symptoms is rarely the source. So if you have if you have pain in your outer knee, chances are, yes, that actually is a victim, but it's not the culprit or culprits that are actually causing it to hurt, if that makes sense. So it's, so it's either, either upstream, upstream or downstream. downstream. It's going to either be upstream or downstream. And we know this yeah. when we look at a joint-by-joint -joint approach, the knee is built for stability, the ankle and hip – just above and below the knee is built for mobility. So when somebody comes in with the knee issue, I'm always looking to say, all right, let's make sure nothing's broken, torn, mauled and maimed, meaning the ligaments are good, the cartilage is good, no um, ligament, no uh, cartilage injuries from the meniscus or tendon injuries. But then I check the ankle and the hip, and sure enough, boom, that's where the issue is. So we do sight treat where it hurts, but that's where you need to start really questioning who you're going to. doesn't matter if you're going to a physical therapist, massage therapist, doesn't matter if you're going to acupuncturist, a chiropractor, you name it. If they're treating the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, you got to start questioning and say, hey, will you check out below? Will you check out above and make sure things are moving on this side mm -hmm. like they are on the other side? And that's where that risk factor of one of these things is not like the other comes into the equation. All right, that's good. Sally, Sally asked, do you endorse regular, regular yoga, yoga along with training? And oh, heck yeah, absolutely. That's a great and perfect way to actively rest, right? And not that yoga is restful. I mean, it depends on the type of yoga we're talking about. Um, a lot of yogas I endorse. There are a few I do not. There's one in particular <laughs> that I tore my meniscus in oh my because God. they were like, oh, you need to straighten your knee in that tree pose. I was like, dude, my, my knee has been injured in the past. Like I tore it up, you know, playing sports. It ain't going to happen. And finally my pride got the best of me and I straightened my knee and sure enough heard the rip right there oh wow. and was like, I tore my meniscus in yoga. I was like, dang, but <laughs> I love a good, good story. story doc. Yeah. But I love yoga. Here's the thing. <laughs> yeah. I love yoga. Also besides yoga, Pilates. That's a great thing. Um, those of us who actually would do awesome in Pilates like me probably should be doing more yoga. I'm really stable. I'm not super, super mobile. So we have a tendency to gravitate towards what's easier. So if you kill it in yoga, start challenging yourself to do something like some Pilates, you know, some stability work in there. But you got to have both. Besides just running, you have to strength train. You have to do mobility work and you got to work on programming and patterning of your running, which doc, I mean, with coach, I want you to do something. I want you to do a webinar sometime and I want to sit in on it and be in on it on pose running yeah. because you got to work on your programming. You have to teach your body how to do it. Well, it won't just guess and make you a good runner. You have to coach it and train it and program it to be a good runner. All right. Um, we've got a few in the group with planter issues lately, and this yeah. is obviously one of the number. We'll probably do one recently you know, coming up on top, and this would be one of the top three. I would, Other than shin splints, right. plantar fasciitis is probably number two. Um, so she, uh, Mallory asks, tips to resolve mild but persistent plantar fasciitis. Like, what do you see as the number one cause? That? Is it lack of dorsiflexion? It's, it's a previous ankle injury. Uh, this is one of those situations where um, – that ankle was injured, you're rolling off the outside of the foot, big toes not flexing up like it should, so it's starting to yank on that plantar fascia more. Um, that's the number one I see in, in plantar fascia injuries uh, is that people will come in 
So two things about plantar fascia injuries. Number one, the vast majority of the time, the pain is not in the plantar fascia. Bing, bing. It's, it's being diagnosed as a plantar fascial issue. By the time they arrive to me, they're like, no, no, this is where the pain is. This is where the pain's always been. And I go, well, let's look up the anatomy. That's not even the plantar fascia. So that's key number one is whoever's telling you it's a plantar fascia injury, is it truly in the plantar fascia? Or are you feeling it where the tendons insert on the bone or somewhere else? That's that's what you got to ask, number one. Make sure your diagnosis is correct because any treatment plan on an incorrect diagnosis is still an incorrect treatment plan, meaning the solution to the equation is still wrong because it's the wrong solution for the equation, right? You got to have the right equation, right solution. Would that normally be to determine it at that level? Would that would that uh, involve an MRI? No, it wouldn't. Yeah, because most most plantar fascial issues, um, particularly if we're talking about a question here that's mild, meaning if if you're mm-hmm. if you're having extreme severe pain, like go get it imaged for sure. Make sure nothing's ripped. Make sure nothing's torn. Make sure you don't have a big bone spur sticking in there. But if we're talking about something that's mild, annoying, just something that just won't go away, it's persisting. There's a mechanical issue downstream or upstream from where it hurts. What's being tugged and what hurts is the victim in between what's not moving well downstream or upstream as a Did result. You, just curious, because I've, I've, I've seen, seen this, this in the past, past though, um, and I'm not I'm saying not it's a pattern, pattern, but I've seen it. Have, have you, you seen, seen improper, improper shoe, shoe fitting, fitting like, like a, a shoe that's, that's too small, small uh, uh, causing, causing problems with plantar? Only, only if you have a foot abnormality, because if it's gonna cause plantar fascia on one side, then you got to ask the question, why is it not happening on the other yeah. side, right? Yeah, that would make sense. And some people do have a longer foot on one side than the other. This is actually a um, injury risk factor. And it's not in everybody, but leg length and foot length is a risk factor. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's not everybody's issue. You can compensate for it. But you need to have both feet measured and fit for the longest foot. Um that is going to that's going to be key number one. If you measure both feet, every in, next time you're in to actually get um, looking at shoes, just say, "Hey, can you measure both sides just to make sure we're even there?" That's key number one. If it's off, fit for the longest foot. Um, key number two is that their second toe is longer than their big toe, hmm. and everybody's getting fit for their big toe, forgetting that their second toe is longer and it's getting jammed. In that process right there so if you have a black toe on that second toe it's because you got fit for the big toe and not not that second toe yeah and then fleet Fleet feet has has a great great, they're called fit id ID, where they 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 scan scan an image image of your foot and they give you your true foot foot size size. yeah that's that's always always different than your true your your shoe size size, which is normally one size up but but, yeah i mean most people are going to have some type of variance there as you know but i mean i'm always like it needs to not be their thumb it needs to be your thumb width between the end of the shoe Okay. okay. And your toes. So if somebody's actually fitting your shoes and they're using their thumb width, you need to bend over and actually use your thumb between your longest toe and the end of the shoe. If you don't have that much room right there, mm-hmm. you don't have number one, enough room to slide without those toes jamming in the front. And number two, you don't have enough room for your foot to swell when you're going to be running and your foot does swell when you're out there running. It has actually get puffier just simply from a lymphatic backflow, not just from a um, inflammation standpoint. Okay, I've got got Paula. Paula. Britain, Britain, she's got a question here. Is there a good resource resource that you can recommend for stretches? stretches. I spend spend nine nine to 10 hours hours straight straight on the computer computer times five days a week. Oh, yeah. A lot of breaks, yeah. Uh, You know, I have not been able to figure out how to really loosen up my hip flexors and have problems on the left side because of it. Yep. Um, I do not, Paula. I mean, I've been in the process, uh, Coach Morlino and myself have been in the process of um, trying to learn how to actually put together learning platforms so that we can throw stuff up there. Mm -hmm. I wish I had a great place to just point people to go, hey, this is a great website, do their stuff. Um, But one of the things you got to understand is most stretching does not work. The majority of stretching does not work. Um, If you actually hold a stretch... And you can do this right now. You can hold any stretch that you want to hold. 
if it's not progressing, I mean, it's not actually getting looser and looser and looser as the seconds go by, then it's not going to work. So static stretching doesn't work. Um, it only works if you work it right. Static stretching only works if you hold it for five to seven minutes. And it works, and it works guys, because this, this guy, guy showed, showed me that. that and, and just a lot of times, this is why when we do um, even, even dynamic, dynamic stretching, stretching before Dynamic track stretching is what works. Yeah. But, but I'll, 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 I'll kind of sprinkle your, your stuff in there, too. We'll, we'll hold the stretch. Stretch, contract. Hold, you know, release. Mm -hmm. Hold, release times three. So, so, Coach, I'm actually, my method has actually gone towards um, using an active stretch first before we even do the stretch, hold, contract, mm -hmm. release type of deal. And we do active stretch before doing the dynamic stretch. And we do dynamic stretching before we even do any rolling, any smashing and rubbing on a uh, lacrosse ball or foam roller or anything mm -hmm. like that. Most people will actually get those um, lacrosse balls, foam rollers out, and they'll go, well, if it's tender, then it needs to actually be rolled. That would be as logical as putting a ball on your foot and standing on top of it going, wow, that hurts. It's tender. Let's go ahead and roll it out. You the know, thing so, I'd, I'd, I'd mention to Paula, Paula um, um, I've, got I've got one right, one right here, here that goes, goes up. up and goes down <laughs> well but but, but just, just a stand, stand up, up desk, desk I, I think this my is desk is is stand up but then also i have a tall seat that i could sit down on and go back and forth so so paula one of the things i would say is um on would a stand up desk help no it doesn't um going from standing to sitting standing to sitting making the transitions is what helps so there's a couple hacks here if you're going to have a stand up desk you got to make sure to take a little break and sit down. You got to make a little sure to stand up. You have to stay moving. Motion is lotion. The best way to actually interrupt just that OC detailed nature of staying focused and being on your computer for working long periods is just crush a lot of water. It is one way that your body will say, stop. I'm about to pee in my pants get up and go to the restroom and literally you won't just walk gently you'll actually jog to the restroom because you're like i gotta make it i gotta make it i gotta make it i gotta get back so the best way to actually hack a lot of desk work and a lot of sitting and i do this when i'm actually doing design work and i'm sitting in front of my computer for four or five six hours is i will just crush water coffee water coffee water coffee and by the way they've now dispelled the myth that coffee dehydrates and is bad for you yes. it's not it's 99.9 .9 water and the caffeine that's in there does not actually cause you too much dehydration and particularly if you're crushing water with it i mean that's the thing i i even water down my coffee because i like iced coffee so i'm pouring my coffee over ice all the time and and crushing water with it but. yeah i think just, just taking, taking frequent, frequent breaks, breaks man I'm, yeah I, I, you know um um and sit in a chair that you can sit on the edge and sit like a dude. I mean, you can get your knees splayed out instead of your knees being closer to those hip lines and crushing the actual labral cartilage in your in your hips. So get in a situation where you can actually uh, act like you're trying to sit on a therapy ball where your legs are wide. Um, and therapy balls don't solve it because I've seen people slouch on therapy balls. And I've also seen people slouch and shift their weight to one side while while working, including yours truly, because I'll be standing up. If you saw a camera of above, I'd be shifted this side, leaning like this. And that's kind of my indication for it's time for a change. Go ahead and sit yeah, down. My, go ahead and move. My mom's 78, and she she busted my chops the other day for, for having bad posture. Yeah, you're like, the mom's still like, going, Michael, sit up. Your posture's bad. But she was yeah. right. I was like, yeah, I was like, I was like hunched, hunched over like, like this. this. Yeah, so I would say make the change. Like, just just change it up. Just stay moving. Um, even if it means you walk out of your door and you walk right back in and get back to work. Mm -hmm. It's just that change up. Yeah. Okay, we've got Sam Mitchell's got a question. How do you know where the, hap where the happy spot is when starting from scratch so you're not doing too much too soon? Are you talking um, – um, Sam, um, you put another comment in there. Um, are you talking about making, like getting back into running, like a return to run type of progression, return to sport progression? Yeah. If so, is, yeah. if so, the best way to do it is based on time or distance. So I start a lot of people out on a return to run progression where I say, hey, if it's been more than eight weeks since you've been out there, let's, and you're dealing with an injury and you're dealing with an injury, Let's go ahead and start with 20 minutes of movement. 
and I have them warm up. And why do I have them warm up? Your fascia that surrounds all your muscles actually goes from a solid state to a liquid state with just a few degrees temperature. So here's the reason why we warm up for preventing injuries is that when you actually get your core temperature above a certain temperature, all that fascia liquefies. It's like butter that only takes a few temp a few um, degrees temperature to actually liquefy. That fascia is built of the same phospholipids and fatty acids that butter is built with. So that's the whole reason why when you're warming up, things go from feeling tight and stiff to all of a sudden, literally within seconds, they feel like something just liquefied and it's now easy. It was effort and now it's become more effortless and that's because your core temperature is now at the point of going, ah, it's warm enough to liquefy that fascia. Now the opposite is true when we cool down, if we jump right into our seat and drive home versus cooling down, that fascia actually cools down in a shortened position and then we wonder why we get out of our car and feel tight and stiff, right? Mm -hmm. That's the point of cool downs, but getting in a return to activity, return to run progression, you gotta have the proper warm up, proper cool down. But then in between, we start to increase the stress load. Like, so for instance, for a 20 minute activity period, I will segment it into four, five minute bouts. And during those five minute bouts, I'll have somebody run for one minute, walk four, one, four, one, four, one, four. We do that three times that week, every other day, and we ask a question at the end of the week. Are you hurting any worse? And are you excessively tired and fatigued? If the answer is no on both of those, we increase. We go to a two, three, two minutes of jog, three minutes walk, two, three, two, three, two, three. Same questions. Do you hurt any worse that week? Do you feel excessively tired? If no, three, two. At the end of that week, if no, four, one. At the end of that week, then we do a solid 20 minutes. So it should take six weeks to get back up to a two to three mile solid run. Continuous, yeah. Yep. And I'm not a huge fan of a continuous run ever. I am a huge fan of hacking the walk run. Run well, for run for yeah. a duration, walk really fast for a duration, run again for a duration, even if you hack it to the point that you go, I want to be a um, 11 minute miler, you know, and you jog for 10 and a half minutes and walk for 30 seconds. That little break is enough. Um, and if you can get into the habit of walking through your rest stops, meaning like, or your water stops, grab a water and just keep moving. Just keep moving, yeah, but walk, think, think, walk, walk. Yeah. yeah. Sam, Sam. Uh, this, this is your year, year girl. girl. Uh, Sam's, uh, Sam's one of our members. members. Sweet. Uh, just, just, just reach out to me. Let's, let's do a Zoom, do a zoom call, call on, on that, that because, because I'm in I'm totally, totally the way, the way Doc, Doc described that, that is exactly, exactly what I'm what doing, I'm doing with, with our, our beginners. And, you know, it's a smarter, it's, not harder approach. Yeah. 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 And, and it's, it's um, um, you know, we're all, we're all at different, different levels, levels and, you know, and, you know, uh, you know, just, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes, sometimes we do, do light, light poles, poles at Memorial, Memorial Park. Park. Sometimes, sometimes you do it for time or distance, but I like, and the problem is like people hear about Galloway's walk, run, walk, this five, one. But sometimes, sometimes you got to flip, flip it the other one. You have to yes. really start, start with a walk, walk run, not a run walk. Absolutely. And then have that progression on that. And what, and what Doc, Doc is talking about is testing those thresholds. thresholds. And it's solving, you, yeah. solving the equation of, too, of the risk factor of too much too soon, right? Mm -hmm. And I always say there's a glass ceiling, and you never know when you're going to hit it. But you got to push it until you hit that glass ceiling and bump up against it and go, okay, now I'm actually a little more sore than I should be. Now I'm a little more tired than I should be. Let's hold it there hold it there, hold it there. And then once your body goes, oh, I'm no longer as sore, I'm no longer as tired, good, let's increase, increase, increase. Oh, I'm sore. But if all you do is rock it up, you're gonna smash through that glass barrier and you're like, oh, now I'm injured again. Great, running must be bad, right? The, the, the other, other thing, thing too, too I, would I would throw in there, and this, this is this is, this is for, for any, if you're not injured, injured or if you're in your, in your groove, groove and, and I, 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 I preach, preach it. it. I don't, I don't know, know how, how, many how many people listen to it, it. <laughs> but, but as, as a guy, guy who's about, about to turn 59, um, start, start your, your run, run with a walk. walk. Absolutely. And finish, finish your run, run with a walk. walk. Absolutely. That's and the warm up, cool down. Yeah. yeah. And a lot, a lot of times, times even, even when we have our long runs, runs in the morning, morning people just, just rocking it out there. They're just flying out of the parking lot at their regular pace instead of using that first mile or two to kind of build into what would be should, should be, be their, their easiest pace, pace of the week. And particularly if you're going to run with a pace group and they're going to take off and do that, 
you need to get there early and you need to go for a walk. You need to go for an out and back to where you're warming yourself up to where when that pace group takes off, you're actually, your fascia's melted and you're ready to rock and roll and go. And the same yeah. is true when you finished, you know, don't go sit down with everybody or hop into the car and go somewhere. Just say, Hey, I'll meet you guys there. Um, and go cool down, go for a walk and, and cool that fascia down. So it stays, um, and that's where you get into sitting. If you sit for long periods, your fascia just kind of solidifies in that position. That's the whole key. And that's the whole reason why you got to trick your body into getting up, whether it's drink so much water that you have to get up and go pee, which we tell people to do on long haul flights, not just for hydration, but just so they get out of their seat and go to the restroom, mm -hmm. um, without having to stop and think about it. But, uh, it's yeah. Warm okay, up. Guys, guys, we've, we've been, been going, going an hour. hour. We, we got, got one, one last, last question. question. This is, uh, <laughs> Vera, Vera, Vera is one of our coaches, coaches uh, doc, okay? okay. Um, so, so I love, I love this, this question because, because there's, there's one, one part, part in here we probably could have went to when you were talking about um, myths, myths. Okay. okay? So, so I'd love, 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 love to address this question. question. Do you recommend warming a muscle up before foam rolling massage? I think you somewhat answered that. But could you kind of talk about all these devices and silver bullets and things that are out there that may or may not be helping people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was sort of my point a second ago. Just because it hurts and just because you're like, oh, I feel like I need that doesn't necessarily mean it's therapeutic. Uh, I always joke with people. I say, if I put your foot on the ground and put a lacrosse ball on top and then I step on it and smash and roll your foot, just because it hurts doesn't mean it's going to be therapeutic, right? You know, people are like, oh, yeah, that would be that'd be retarded if you actually put a ball on my foot and you stepped on it and smashed my toe. Um, <laughs> tender spots are just there for your body to go ow, that hurts. Now, if it's a fascial issue where your fascia is tight, wouldn't it make more sense to actually get your fascia to liquefy first before mm -hmm. smashing it? You can rip the fascia. I've seen people rip their fascia and their muscles using these devices and I've seen the massage guns be used to the point that you can create more inflammation just because people are pounding it. I mean, it's kind of funny when people go, I love your percussion gun. And that's what we call them. We call them percussion guns because they percuss like this versus massage back and forth like that. Um, massage would be a sort of a transverse friction. Percussion is in and out almost like you're almost like you're jackhammering something, right? So people go, I love your percussion gun. It always works better than mine. And I'm like, no, my, my gun is no more special than yours. It's just a technique. Um, yeah. And most people don't realize that you got to let the gun do the work. Everybody's pushing the gun into themselves versus holding it off their body and just lightly percussing. It does not take much percussion with those guns and it does not take much rolling with the foam roller or lacrosse ball mm -hmm. to actually get things to release. It's a, it's a technique issue, not necessarily a tool issue. So for instance, when people don't have any of these tools and they're off in a um, hotel somewhere, I go, hey, is there a Comcast remote anywhere or TV remote? And they're like, oh yeah. I like, great, get that. And we'll show them how to actually work their psoas iliacus or, or whatever with that. And they're like, oh my gosh, it worked. You know, or grab a wooden spoon. Let's use that wooden spoon. So it really doesn't take any fancy tools. It's just your technique that actually does the trick, which I'm going to tee it up. If any of y'all are interested, let's do one of these technique specific webinars where we just focus on like the massage gun, or we just focus cool. on a roller yeah. or a ball, um, or we use little instruments that we can strip things out with you know, and work smarter, not harder, meaning don't torture yourself. I'm not a fan of do it till it hurts or go as hard as you need to so that it hurts. I'm, I'm all about do the minimal amount of work to get the maximal amount of results. Okay. okay. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Guys, guys, we're, we're going to wrap, wrap it. it. Um, um, I've well, thanks got, for coming y'all. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate, appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. it. Um, D D Doc, Doc and I, and I became we've always, we've always been, been pretty good, good friends, friends but we became, became, became really, really good friends, friends during COVID, COVID because we were bored to tears. tears he had to he shut had his shut clinic down yeah. as you guys, guys know yeah and houston, houston had to shut down in flight a bit and, and we, we just would get on streams, streams like this, this and collaborate and talk about, about things, things. So, so 
you'll probably see, see this guy more often. often. <laughs> okay. Um, um, but, but I've, I've got, got all this information, information there on the screen, screen for you guys. If you, you want to follow, follow him on social, social media, media. If, if you've got, got any, any maybe follow-up follow questions, you can hit him up there on, on email. email. Okay. okay. But, but um, uh, again, again, this is just a starting point. And Doc has always been my go-to guy for injuries, even though he's in Nashville. With with the tech the way we have it in great formats like this, we can – we can do more, much, much, much more. Okay. Well, what they don't realize is we probably spend um, five or six hours a week going back on Marco Polo. <laughs> like we're yeah. we're in our cars shooting each other videos all the time. What do you think about this? How about that? Yeah. Most of it is tech talk. Um, if you guys could be a fly on the wall at some of our conversations. Oh, my gosh. We said, be... we said sometime we're going to have to go back and chop up some of those videos and just post them <laughs> because we get into a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. yeah. Stuff, Stuff that, that may, may not, not even, even that, that probably, probably wouldn't, wouldn't be even for them, them probably, probably yeah. too much. All right, guys. All right, guys. Um, um, and then if you guys aren't, familiar, aren't familiar with in-flight, in flight, we're here in Houston. Houston. We'd, love we'd love to have you on our, our team. team. Great program. Um, yeah, we'd, yeah, we'd love, love to, to have, have you. And, have you. and, and if, if not, not we, you know, we'll be doing some online programs. And Doc has got some things brewing, too. Ways to literally teach you how to rehab yourself, which is kind of crazy. How to fix yourself. Yeah, the website's going to be called... I fix myself.com. It basically is how I'm showing you how I fix myself and why I don't need to have a chiropractor, physical therapist, et cetera, all the time. Yeah. So teaching you how to get the power back. All right, guys. All right, guys appreciate appreciate it. it. Thanks for coming. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Stay, Stay tuned. tuned. We'll have, we'll have, uh, we'll have, we'll have many, many more webinars, webinars like this. Just, just kind of drilling it a little bit deeper, deeper for you guys yeah. in the future. Okay. okay. Have a good have night. night. Oh, oh, what was that? Applause. Ooh. <laughs> See you guys. All right.